All right, so what we're going to do today is we're going to continue in the Heart of the Matter series with Part 7, I believe. This is Part 7. Some of you are probably thinking, man, is he ever going to finish this thing? And some of you are excited that it's not ending yet because it's been a good series. I'm hoping that more of you are in that camp than the other. But I think that literally this is the heart of the matter. And that dealing with this is critical to all that we're doing and all that we're understanding in our walk is to literally root out and understand and embrace the heart of the matter. And so I don't want to shortchange this at all. And by the way, what I also think I'm learning from this series that I think we're going to be doing in future teachings is that I'm learning that there may be a benefit in our walk now that I'm hoping we're growing far enough forward in our walk to go beyond the need for a teaching to be an hour. In other words, we do these multi-part teachings so we can really dig into a subject. Think about it like when you went to college. You know, you would take a course, the course would take you at least a semester to go through, or two semesters or more to go through because it would be broken up into two sections. And that's how you thoroughly studied out a subject. And I think we've done way too much of these surface studies, the scratching the surface and just kind of getting a, a small understanding of things, that maybe it's time that we had enough patience to really go through as many verses that we can to deal with the subject so that we get a thorough understanding. And, and so there's a teaching that I'm, I'm working on. There's a couple of them I'm working on that I want to change what I originally did, which tried to make it fit in the normal hour, hour and a half, and not worry about that and dig it into its completion, whether that takes two parts or three or four, and not worry about how many parts it takes. Now, I know there's probably going to be people that are going to go to the website and they're going to see, you know, heart of the matter, part seven. Wow, that's too intimidating. I don't even think I want to do part one. I don't think I want to commit to seven parts, you know. But I think that we have to grow up now when it's not elementary school anymore and it's not high school anymore. We're up to college level. We need to really understand these things. And so I don't think we should be trying to box it in. Are we in agreement? Amen. So we are going to try to get through the Psalms here for the heart of the matter. And then once we get through the Psalms, I have it scheduled to go through the Proverbs and then into the Prophets and then into the Brick Shah, into the Renewed Covenant. But I want us to really understand these issues in a much deeper way than we have before. And probably some of the teachings that I've done in the past, we will redo them, but we'll extend them in their depth because I think that that's what's been lacking, because quite frankly, you've heard enough one-hour teachings on these subjects, and the one-hour teachings tend to cover all the same exact stuff, because you try to hit the highlights as best you can and bring it all together. But you know what? When you read Scripture, don't you find that the Almighty put the same thing in multiple places over and over again, and you wonder, why is he telling me this again and again and again? And I believe the answer is because you need to hear it again and again and again. Now, it's funny how people tend to focus on the verse that stands sort of by itself. You'll have somebody saying something once, and people get all excited, and they want to share that insight with everybody and make their whole theology based on something that appears once in Scripture. Now, I'm not here to discount the value of the thing said once. However, I want to elevate the value of the thing said 47 times. I want to emphasize and encourage you that the thing said 47 times is probably a little more important than the thing said once. Why? Because the Almighty wanted to make sure you heard it. So he made sure that almost every writer said something about it. And so when you read something in Moses' writings in the first five books, and then you read it again in the writings of like the Kings or Samuel or Chronicles, and then you read it again in Proverbs and the Psalms, and you read it again in the Prophets, and you read it again in the Brit Kadashah, now we're talking about something that's important. And the beauty is that when we read all these different writers saying the same thing, we know it's the same spirit, we know it's the same message, coming from the Creator being. We also know that if somebody was trying to manhandle this book and mess with what it said, it'd be a little bit tough to mess with something that appears 47 times. Not too hard to mess with something that appears once. And so I tend to want to focus most of my attention on the things said an abundance of time by multiple witnesses. And quite frankly, the issues of the heart appears everywhere 
in almost every chapter. So we could literally just read the entire scriptures and then cover this. So rather than do that, I've tried to put, you know, pull out some of the ones where it makes some major points about the heart and the heart issues. And I think that it's also benefited us. I know it's benefited me. I'm hoping it's benefited you that in doing this, instead of reading a verse or two, we're reading entire Psalms or entire chapters so that we get a much more full and broad spectrum understanding of context. And so that's been something that we've been doing. So having said all of that, let's turn to Psalm to Tehillim 17. Psalm Tehillim 17. And we're going to go ahead and read this Psalm and get into the heart of the matter. Tehillim Psalm 17. And we'll begin in verse 1. Hear righteousness, Yahweh. Listen to my cry. Give ear to my prayer. From lips without deceit. Let my right ruling go out from your presence. Let your eyes see what is right. You examined my heart. You have visited me in the night. You have tried me. You find I have not schemed. My mouth would not transgress. So let's stop there for a second. So he's crying out to Yahweh. The writer of Psalm 17 is crying out to Yahweh saying, Hear righteousness. Listen to my cry. Give ear to my prayer. Not only just any prayer and anything, but it's from lips without deceit. So here's a connection that we're starting to see, that if you're going to cry out to Yahweh, that you should cry in righteousness, and righteousness he then defines as being lips without deceit. He's also giving us more depth in verse 3 by talking about his heart having been examined and his, and, and having been tried, he was found not to have schemed. And I know we read these words like schemed and we start thinking about these major plots and things that people do. When you decide in your heart that something's right, even though scripture may not say so, that's scheming. When you try to get others to agree with you, you're now scheming and plotting to get others to agree with you that doing what is wrong is now right. Because then you start to think, well, if I can get others to agree with me, now that now we're in the scheming stage. Hmm, if I can go talk to some people and convince them that what I'm doing is okay, even though I know it's not, but it's what I want to do. So now we're going to put spins on things. And so that's where the word deceit comes in here because we have this idea that he says, my lips are without deceit. And it's not just deceit to others, it's deceit to yourself. Because that's where it starts. We deceive ourselves. And so he says, Hear righteousness, Yahweh, listen to my cry. And we're going to be doing a teaching at some point here in the very near future on prayer called Master, Teach Us to Pray. I have it already written. It's kind of that 60-minute format, and I want to now redo it and extend it. And it's going to have some of this in here. Hear my cry. Isn't that what you think you're doing when you're praying? You're just crying out to Yahweh? But are you crying out also wanting him to do verse 3, to examine your heart to visit you at night, to try you, to find out whether or not you've been scheming or being deceitful. Because I think that's implied here in the verse. Verse 4, he says, As for the deeds of men, by the words of your lips, I have kept myself from the paths of the destroyer. So this is, again, you want to have your cries heard. It may be important to keep your steps, your paths, from the destroyer's paths. Who's the destroyer? Asatan, the destroyer. What is his what is his primary MO? What's his method of operation? His method of operation is to get you to buy into his scheme. His scheme is to get you to question, did Yahweh really say? And that's where we get into the biggest trouble. And you know this when you talk to friends and family, when they say things like, Well, I'm sure God will honor this or God will honor that. Now, you can be sure of that, by the way, if you can find it in Scripture. Then you can absolutely be sure that he will honor what you're doing if Scripture says he will. And Scripture does tell you what he, what he will honor and what he does not honor. And so we have to be very careful with that. And when it says here, it says, I have kept myself from the paths of the destroyer. Let's throw in, and I know this is going to get that ball rolling again, he says, I have kept myself. 
See, there's a personal responsibility to do actions, to take action, to work or make effort yourself. It doesn't say, you have kept me from the paths of the destroyer. He says, I have kept myself from the paths of the destroyer. My steps have held fast to your paths. My feet have not slipped. That's verse 5. You have a participatory role in this. Easy for me to say. You have a participatory role in this. We have been lied to and told that once you become a quote-unquote believer, that all of these things are going to be done for you. No, that's not what Psalm 17 is saying. It is saying that when you go before him and cry out, hear my cry, you may want to also tell him, I have made every effort to keep my path off the destroyer's path, to keep my steps on your paths, to keep my feet from slipping. See, we look to him, though, when we do slip. We look to him, though, when we're having a trouble with our footing. So he'll reach out and help to stabilize us and to steady us and to hold us and hold our hand because it's participatory. You're not doing it yourself, but he's not doing it for you. You get to do it together. Amen? I mean, that's the best part of this whole thing is he's doing it with you. We're doing this together. He says, verse 6, I've called upon you for your answer, for your, uh, for you, your answer me, O L. Incline your ear to me, hear my speech. Let your kindness be distinguished, you who save by your right hand those who take refuge from those who rise up. Guard me as the apple of your eye, hide me under your shadow of your wings, from the face of the wrong who ravage me, from my deadly enemies who surround me. They are enclosed in their own fat, they speak proudly with their mouths, they have now surrounded us in our steps, they set their eyes to cast us to the ground, like a lion who is eager to tear his prey and has a young lion crouching in cover. Well, let's deal with this section a little bit. He says in verse 7, You who save by your right hand those who take refuge from those who rise up. Now, this is where you do need to stop your effort. When you're in trouble, you need to now seek him. You take refuge in him. You don't try necessarily to figure it all out and fix it yourself. We're talking about these major serious battles, these spiritual battles, the battles that you really can't fight yourself. Because listen to the way he's talking about it. He says, deadly enemies who surround me in verse 9, the wrong who ravage me. See, he's he's already acknowledging he's in a situation beyond his ability to deal with it. And so he's taking refuge in the Almighty. And the connection is again connected to the destroyer when we see these words like, They're like a lion who is eager to tear prey, a young lion crouching in the cover. And we know Hasatan is like a lion seeking to see whom he can devour. So there's a connection that these people, these deadly enemies, are acting in the path of or as agents of or in accordance with the desires of the enemy himself. Now, they may not be willing accomplices. They may not even be aware that they're doing it but they are being at least, at the very minimum, unwilling or unwittingly duped, um, what's the word I'm looking at, representatives or, you know, uh, tools of the enemy. And this is something that we have to understand. Just because somebody's doing this doesn't mean they're even aware of it. They may have no idea. What's it say in other verses? It says, there will be those that will set you up for death, basically, to be taken captive who think they're doing the Almighty's work. So some of these are going to be very well-meaning people who think they're doing things right. And they don't have any idea whose side they're really working for. And the reason is because they don't really understand the book that you have in your hands with the instructions that it gives. And so they read it in error. They read it in blindness. They read it in delusion. If they're reading it at all, all they're hearing in their voice when they're reading the verses is what everybody else has already told them the verse means. They're not being Berean. They're not going before the Father and asking him personally, what does this verse mean? And personally, how do I get the right context for for this verse? What are you really trying to say? Because if you guys are sitting here listening to me and that's all you're getting out of this, you're making the same mistake as they are. You need to go back and do the Berean thing and say, okay, Steve just said a whole bunch of stuff. He claims these verses mean A, B, and C. 
Well, let's go back and take this before the Father. Seek the teacher in you, the Ruach HaKodesh, the Holy Spirit to teach you. And then you may have the discernment that some of the people that have been teaching you have some errors that have been leading you into trouble. But you're not going to know if you don't check it out. Verse 13, he says, Arise, O Yahweh, confront him, cause him to bend, deliver my being from the wrong by your sword, from men by your hand, O Yahweh, from men of the world whose portion is in this life, and you fill their bellies with your treasure. They are satisfied with children and shall leave their treasures to their babes. So what he's talking about here in this verse and also in verse 10 when he talked about they are enclosed in their own fat, they speak proudly. These are people that are having their reward now. They're seeking to have their successes, their riches, their pleasures in this world today. We're told to lay up our treasures in heaven. And so he's saying, okay, that's all well and good for them. But notice how now what he says in verse 15. He says, as for me, however, let me see your face in righteousness. I am satisfied to see your appearance when I awake. And by the way, that should be taken on a deeper level to mean when you're resurrected. You'll be, in other words, he's saying, I don't need the riches now. I don't need the accolades now. I don't need all of the pleasures of this world now. It will be more than sufficient for me to be satisfied knowing that I will get to see your face at your appearance when I awake. Should that not be enough? But we sit and go, How come they're looking like they're succeeding? That's not fair. You ever say those words, you're already in trouble. That's the first sign of big trouble right there is when you're going before the Almighty going, it's not fair. You don't know what fair is. Is it fair that Mashiach had to die because of you? And let's take this personally because if it had only been you, he still would have had to die. No, he had to die because of me too. And every one of you in this room and everybody on the planet that ever lived. But individually, it's because of you. Was that fair? I mean, is that really in your mind fair that, that you could live? He had to give up everything to come into flesh, suffer the unbelievable indignations that were put upon him so that you could live. That's the most unfair thing that's ever happened ever. That's why it's by grace that you are saved. Because you couldn't possibly deserve this. You couldn't earn it. Because you've already done plenty to bring all kinds of judgment on yourself, which is why you need the covering of the blood. Because you've already brought those judgments upon yourself. Now, you can repent and say you won't do it again, but it doesn't change the fact that you already did it. And doing it has already earned you the penalty of death. And not doing it and repenting does not earn you the reward of long life and eternal life. It's the shed blood that covers you that gives you that. But it's only going to give you that if you repent and teshuva and commit not to do these things again, because he's not going to commit to give you eternal life so you can continue sinning. You know, people say all the time, and I hear these, and I don't know why, it's like the most insane thing I've ever heard, but they'll say things like, if you try to do the Torah, it's like you're mocking the Messiah and saying that what he did wasn't good enough. It's the opposite. If you say the law was done away with, and then you're saying his death was of no use, and then you're mocking his death. Because he gave his life for you so that you could do the instructions, but that you could also be covered when you fell short. Because you would be making a mockery of him if you continued in the sin that was necessary for him to die. Let me rephrase that. Continued in the sin that was made it necessary for him to die. Okay, so you sinned. That made it necessary for a Mashiach to die so that you can continue to sin. That's, that's just ridiculous. But yet you hear this being preached all the time. They don't use those words, of course, because then it would sound ridiculous. They use words like, well, that was done away with and it was nailed to the cross and that was for them and this is for you. And they'll try to use these things like dispensationalism to say, well, that was for them, but it's not for you. You don't have to do that stuff. Just, no. See, they're really saying that what he did is a license for you to continue doing sin. 
And so, so that is, that is, to me, you know, ridiculousness in the extreme, absurdity in the extreme. Let's continue and now look in Psalm 19, Tehillim 19. The heavens are proclaiming the esteem of El, and the expanse is declaring the work of his hand. Day to day pours forth speech, and night to night reveals knowledge. There is no speech, and there are no words. Their voice is not heard. Their line has gone out through all the earth, and their words to the end of the world. In them he set up a tent for the sun, and it is like a bridegroom coming out of his room. It rejoices like a strong man to run the path. Its rising is from one end of the heavens and its circuit to the other end, and naught is hidden from its heat. Now, we're going to now read the next verse, and we're going to see what does the next verse have to do with the previous six verses? Because the next verse says, The Torah of Yahweh is perfect, bringing back the being. The witness of Yahweh is trustworthy, making wise the simple. The orders of Yahweh are straight, rejoicing the heart. The commands of Yahweh is clear, enlightening the eyes. The fear of Yahweh is clean, standing forever. The right rulings of Yahweh are true. They are righteous altogether. Now let me stop there for a second. What he did in the first six verses is remind you just who he is. He's the one who created the heavens and the expanse and the day by and the day and the night and had the sun and the moon. He's the great creator of the universe. And so this is just beautiful poetic, poetic language to show you that he wants to make sure he's letting you know who we're talking about. And then after telling you that this one who we're talking about here in the first six verses, this is the one whose instructions are perfect. Now how can we in the same book read that the Torah of Yahweh is perfect and it brings back the being that the witness of Yahweh is trustworthy, making wise the simple. The orders of Yahweh are straight, rejoicing the heart, and then still have somebody tell us that they don't want to go back under that burdensome law. Oh, I don't want to go, and they say it with like, like they want to spit. Like, I don't want to go, burdensome law. They say law like it's a, like it's a cancer or something. The law. I don't know. Send him back to Psalm 19. Tell him to start reading verse 7. Okay? The orders of Yahweh are straight, rejoicing the heart. Any of you, once you came to start learning Torah, did you feel the rejoicing in your heart? Amen. It says here that the commands of Yahweh are clear and they enlighten the eyes. Did you feel like the more you learned Torah, the more the world and life made sense? that it made things clear, that's part of why your heart is rejoicing. Because you're now seeing things clearly. It's giving you understanding, enlightening you. The fear of Yahweh is clean, standing forever. The right rulings of Yahweh are true. They are righteous altogether. This goes back to the thing that I've said many times, and you guys have heard this, but we're going to say it again for this CD. When you talk to people, you may want to ask them three simple questions. Does Yahweh change? The answer should be a very simple, easy no. If Yahweh says something is right, can it ever be wrong? No. He just said that. He didn't hear. He says, the righteousness of Yahweh, uh, his right rulings are true. They are righteous altogether. That the Torah is perfect. They endure forever. Now... The third question, if Yahweh says something is wrong, can it ever be right? No. Otherwise, he'd be changing, right? And then you say, fine, now tell me how your dispensationalist thing works. See, if he says it's wrong to eat pork, then it's always going to be wrong to eat pork. If he says it's right to keep the feasts, then it's always going to be right to keep the feasts. If he says it's right to keep the Sabbath, it's always going to be right to keep the Sabbath. If he says it's wrong to work on Shabbat, it's always going to be wrong to work on Shabbat. If he says it's wrong to steal, it's always wrong to steal. If he says it's wrong to commit adultery, it's always wrong to commit adultery. If he says it's right to do whatever, it's always going to be right to do the whatever. The only way you're going to know is to read the book. He gives us an instruction manual. He says, in this manual, I'm going to tell you what is right and what is wrong. And it's going to enlighten you, it's going to make things clear, and you're going to be able to be rejoicing in your heart to know what is true. 
It's that simple. It's not really that complicated. Now, notice the way the writer of the psalm, how he feels about what he just said previous to this, about how the orders are straight and the commands are clear and the witness is trustworthy. He says, this is more desirable than gold, verse 10, than much fine gold and sweeter than honey and the honeycomb. Again, remind your friends to read this who want to tell you, you're not getting me to go back under that law. My answer, by the way, normally when they say that is, by the way, you can't go back under something you never did. <laughs> Let's simplify this, please. Okay, you can't go back to something you never did. So don't tell me, well, you ain't getting me to go back under that law. I know I'd like you to start doing it for the first time, actually. And then in doing so, your heart might start to delight and rejoice because you'll realize he loves you. Remember we talked about this at, at the core of what we teach in this ministry is Deuteronomy 10, 12. What does it say? In order. It says, fear Yahweh. The verse says, and now Yisrael, does, what does Yahweh want? Right? What does he want of you? Fear him. And then walk in all his ways. So he wants you because you're afraid of him, because you respect him, because you have this awe and reverence, that you're going to do what he said, not even understanding it at all. Walk in all his ways. And then it says, and to love him. Now, when you fear him and you start walking in all his ways, first thing you're going to realize is that his ways bless you, keep you safe, and change you from what you are into what he is. Therefore, you realize how abundantly he loves you. And then you start to really fall in love with him. Not this emotional, you were in a praise service and the song moved you and you, got, you ran up and made an altar call and you got all emotional. No, because that's the kind of thing like the sower of the seed and it goes there and it goes into the ground and phew, the first blow of wind it's, and the roots aren't even there. See, that's not enough. You've got to have that point where you start doing the things and you start to realize, wow, he loves me. I mean, not just, I'm, I'm afraid I'm going to die. I don't want to go to hell. I want to go to heaven. But it's he loves me, and I love him because he loves me and because he wants me to be safe, and he wants me to be taken care of, and he wants to provide for my needs, and he loves me enough to tell me how to find that safe path. Then we deeply start to fall in love with him. Once we fall in love with him, then we'll want to serve him with all our heart and with all our being. See, that's why Deuteronomy 10, 12 is so important. It lays the process out there. So when you go and tell me, and I've had people tell me this all the time, well, I don't understand this, so I'm not going to do it. Well, then you may never understand it. Because you may not understand it till you do it. Look, I was told very clearly by a rabbi when I first started looking into my walk as a teenager, and I started looking at Shabbat. Now, remember, I was born Jewish and raised a secular Jew. Actually, I'm Levite. I'm a Kohen. But I wasn't raised keeping anything. And you know what the book that he gave me? He gave me a book about Shabbat. It said, you will not truly understand this till you do it. I can't. The book, the author said, I can't really explain this to you in a way that will make sense till you do it. Do you not feel the same way? When you try to explain what goes on in this service today to your friends that don't keep Shabbat and don't come to a service like this, when you try to explain to them why you're at services for like eight hours and they wonder what, you know, they're all looking at their watch 15, 30 minutes into their service waiting to get out of there. Okay, they look at you like, how could you possibly want to be together for like eight or nine hours? Now, for those listening on the CD, the service doesn't actually run eight hours. But after eight hours of fellowship after services, I mean, I have to throw people out. That You can't explain that to people. They've got to experience it. They've got to experience it. And so... You know, we look at these things and we're embracing these things and we, and we talk to people and then they give you these lines like, well, you, you know, I don't understand it, so I'm not going to do it. Or I'm not going to do it till I understand it. Why do you think the story of Abraham and Yitzhak and the Akeda is in the scriptures? When did Abraham ever ask Yahweh to explain what was going on when he told him to go kill his son? I, I, maybe it happened, but it's not in the book. It's not recorded anywhere. All you hear is him saying, okay, yes, sir, you know, I don't get it, but I trust you. That was the whole point. I don't get it, but I trust you. And so Yahweh is asking you to do the same thing as you come out of wherever you were and come out of my people, and now you're embracing him 
and you're starting to look at what he's saying to do and not do, he's saying, trust me. Look, when you read the Torah portions that we're going through right now, as the Israelites are coming out of Egypt, the main thing that you're going to see from that point forward is a huge problem with trust. They whined and complained, not because they were hungry and thirsty, but because they didn't trust. Now, they still were hungry and thirsty, but they weren't trusting. Now, he let them get hungry and thirsty to see if they would trust. Because quite frankly, if he just kept giving them water and food abundantly all the time, they would not be tested to be proven to see whether it's in their heart to keep the commandments or not. Oh, wow, that's Deuteronomy 8 too, our other favorite verse. And so he had to let them get thirsty and hungry. But we need to get to the point where this, in the psalm that we're reading here, in Psalm 19, verse 10, where everything we just read from verse 7 to verse 10 is embraced as being more desirable than gold, sweeter than the honey from the honeycomb. I mean, if you would rather watch TV than read this book, you're not there yet. If you would rather do anything than read the Word and relationship with your Father, then you're not there yet. Look, I'm not going to you know, stand up here and make you think I think I'm there yet. I'm not there yet. I don't think any of us are there yet. But we need to get there. And the more we get in that direction, the more this will all start to work and make sense. But that's what it has to be. We have to want to look at this stuff and uh, not want to look at it, embrace it as more desirable than gold. Verse 11, also your servant is warned by them. In guarding them, there is great reward. What did we talk about in the Are You Saved series? Doing the Torah is going to affect your reward. And here it says very clearly, in doing these things, in obedience, there is great reward. So I guess I wasn't stepping out on a limb there. Who discerns mistakes, verse 12? Declare me innocent from those that are secret. Also keep your servant back from presumptuous ones. Do not let them rule over me. Then shall I be perfect and innocent and innocent of great transgression. Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be pleasing before you, O Yahweh, my rock and my redeemer. That should be your prayer. Again, we're getting back to the heart of the matter. Here's another heart verse. He says, let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart, which I'm believing here he's telling you should be congruent, the words of your mouth should be completely congruent with the heart, with the meditations of your heart, because out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. You see the connection? You see, here's another writer saying exactly the same thing as the writer who said, out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. I mean, he's just using different words to say it, but it's the same thing. But the desire here is that the abundance of our heart would be rejoicing in Torah, so that the words that come out of our mouth would be pleasing to him. As we embrace him as our rock and our redeemer. Let's go to Psalm 26. Tehillim 26. Tehillim 26 in verse 1. Rule me rightly, O Yahweh, for I have walked in my integrity, and I have trusted in Yahweh without wavering. I don't even want to go to the next verse till we deal with this. These are the words you want to say and mean and be true when you go before the Almighty. You want to say to him, rule me rightly, and you know he will because everything he does is righteousness. But notice what he says in the rest of the verse. I have walked in my integrity. See, I don't think that's a word that's talked about enough by the teachers and preachers out there. It's to understand what it means to be doing this stuff with integrity. Most of the time when it talks about doing things perfectly, it's talking about being a fullness of integrity. And so do you have integrity? Because notice what he says here in the rest of the verse. He says, and I have trusted in Yahweh without wavering. Can we honestly say these words? Are you walking in integrity and are you trusting without wavering? the almighty creator of the universe? I would venture to say that we find ourselves all too often not. And that's when we end up on our knees and we're embarrassed and we're crying out, forgive me, forgive me. 
But that's the goal here, though. The goal here is to be able to walk in your integrity and to trust without wavering. You might want to write that verse down and meditate on it and ask the Almighty to show you everything that that means in your life. Show you where you're not in integrity in your walk. Show you where you're not trusting Him without wavering. See, because our goal is to be transformed and conformed into the image of Yeshua, the Son. And the one thing that we can absolutely say about Yeshua is that He walked in His integrity and He trusted the Almighty without wavering. That's the example He showed us. He said, everything my Father says, that I do. And he trusted on to death without wavering. Verse 2. So now after saying that, saying that you're walking in integrity and you are trusting without wavering, then I believe without fear you can say the next thing. Examine me, O Yahweh, and prove me. Try my kidneys and my heart. Because if you're not in your integrity and you're wavering in your, tr in your uh, trustworthiness of him, that examination may be a little scary. But what you can do in a more gentle way is say, Abba, I know I'm probably not walking in my integrity, and I'm probably not fully trusting you without wavering. Please examine me and show me where I'm lacking in these areas so that I can fix it, so that we can work together to fix it. See, the problem is there's all too many people walking around going, I'm okay, I'm fine. And then Abba has to show them where they're not. Because now they're thinking they stand, forgetting that you have to beware if you think you stand, lest you fall. And we become a little haughty. Verse 3, for your kindness is before my eyes, and I've walked in your truth. Your kindness is before my eyes. Hmm, what could that mean? I think it's his instructions. I don't think there's anything greater in kindness than telling you how to love him and how to love each other, which is what the instructions tell you. Because not telling you would be the opposite of kindness, just to leave you to yourself like most of the world. That's why most of the world screws it up so bad. They have no idea how to love each other. They have no idea how to love the Creator, even if they even know he exists. But in his kindness, he's let you know. And so his kindness is always before your eyes. Not only that, but if you always have it in front of your eyes, in other words, you're aware of it all the time, just how kind he's been to you, you might make different decisions. You might choose to go down a different path than you may have chosen to put your foot on at that moment. Because as his kindness is before you, you can sit there and say, how can I just turn left like I was about to after everything he's done to be kind to me? How can I turn right after what he's done for me? How can I do anything but go straight? That's if you can keep his kindness always before your eyes. That's if you can do that. And then he says, and I have walked in your truth. I don't know, that sounds again like action. He says, I didn't just acknowledge your truth. I didn't just learn about your truth. I didn't just study your truth. I actually walked it out. It actually is something that I chose to start doing. This is the key. He says, I have walked in your truth. I have not sat with the men of falsehood, nor do I enter with pretenders. Now, we could spend a whole long time just on that verse, and I ask you, just pray yourself to understand what that's talking about. Are we sitting with men of falsehood? What does that really mean? Think about who you spend your time with. And also the idea of entering with pretenders. That's a really scary term to be thought of as a pretender. And we're not going to have time to get into those two things right now, but just that's something we may talk about in another point. But pray about that. Father, am I sitting with falsehood, men of falsehood? Am I doing and entering with people that are pretenders? Am I being a pretender? Am I a man of falsehood? These are scary thoughts. Ask him for, your, for discernment. Ask him for help on these things. I have hated the assembly of evildoers, and I do not sit with the wrong. Look, notice what he says here. 
I have hated the assembly of evildoers. So he's not saying that he hated the people necessarily. He's hating the system, the organization, the structure. The same thing I've told you, you need to have a righteous indignation towards the bad systems out there that are enslaving and entrapping people from the truth. He said, look at how he distinguishes this. I did not sit with the wrong, who I'm guessing were a part of the assembly of evildoers. Because remember, evil, according to Scripture, is anything that breaks Torah. You break the Sabbath, that's evil. You steal, that's evil. You commit adultery, that's evil. You don't keep the feast, that's evil. You eat the wrong foods, that's evil. They're all evil. Okay? He says, though I did not sit with the wrong, because the wrong ones are doing evil, and I've hated. So I've been accused of being way too hard on systems and groups that are teaching not to do this stuff. David, or whoever's writing this psalm here, is saying, I have hated the assembly of evildoers. I, have, I don't sit with the wrong. That's a pretty strong term. He says, I wash my hands in innocence and I walk around your altar, O Yahweh, to raise a voice of thanksgiving and to declare all your wonders. That's critical. How often are you going before him to raise a voice of thanksgiving? One of the greatest sins Israel had and continued to have all, have all, through, all, all through the scriptures is a lack of thankfulness and appreciation for everything he had done. They always wanted more. It was always, what have you done for me lately? Can you imagine the audacity, the gall, to treat the creator of the universe like that? But we're that way. All we want to do right away is scream out, save me again, save me again. I need you again. Instead of starting out saying, I know I don't deserve the least of the things you've done for me in my life, and I so appreciate even knowing you exist, but if it would be okay with you, could you help me again? The thankfulness. How about going before him when you're not needing him and not screaming for help and just saying, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you that I didn't have a problem today. Thank you that I didn't trip and skin my knee. Thank you that I didn't get bumped in the head. And I don't even mean these things literally, I mean spiritually. Thank you that I didn't get kicked in the teeth, usually with my own foot. I know it's going to take you a while to picture that. But we do that, don't we? Well, on our way to sticking it in our mouth, we kick our teeth out. It sounds funny, but we do it all the time. He says, in verse 8, he says, Yahweh, I have loved the abode of your house and the place where your esteem dwells. Do not gather my being together with sinners, nor my life with bloodthirsty men and whose hand is a plot, and their right hand is filled with bribes. But as for me, here it is again, I walk in my integrity, redeem me, and show me favor. My foot shall stand on a level place. In the assemblies, I bless Yahweh. Now, this isn't a prideful arrogance saying, hey, I walk in my integrity, you know. This is him saying very humbly, I have done everything I can to walk with integrity. Please honor that and redeem me and show me favor. And that should be our approach. And that word integrity is, 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 is completely critical to this whole understanding. Let's see if we can get through one more. Let's go to Psalm 27. Yahweh is my light and my deliverance. Whom should I fear? Yahweh is the refuge of my life. Whom should I dread? Now this is the psalm that I wanted to connect to this week's Torah portion a little bit. Because remember, they were in full-blown panic I know your verses in your scriptures will probably say that they were greatly afraid. No. I don't even think there's a word that's strong enough. Panic probably doesn't even do it. They were absolutely losing their minds. Because they knew that the way the law worked in Egypt, that slaves were not going to just be gathered back and brought back. They were dead. And it wasn't going to be gentle and it wasn't going to be pretty. They were going to be punished in the extreme if Pharaoh was going to get to them. And they saw no way out. So this is one of those places where they were in the highest extreme of panic. 
And so this is a psalm that if you, as we read it, we can see that it connects back maybe to those days. It says, Yahweh is my light and my deliverance. Whom should I fear? Yahweh is my refuge of my life. Whom should I dread? When evildoers come against me to eat up my flesh, my adversaries and my enemies, they shall stumble and fall. Though an army encamps against me, my heart does not fear. Though battle comes up against me, even then I would be trusting. Doesn't that sound a lot like what they were going through? Now, I know David is probably here talking about what happened to him many times, but this is exactly what was happening to Israel as they were up against the Sea of Reeds. One matter, verse 4, I asked of Yahweh, this I seek, to dwell in the house of Yahweh all the days of my life, to see the pleasantness of Yahweh and to inquire of his hekel, of his tabernacle, of his temple. For in the day of evil he hides me in his booth. In the covering of his tent he hides me. On a rock he raises me up. And now my head is lifted up above my enemies all around me, and I offer in his tent with shouts of joy. I sing, yea, I shall sing praises to Yahweh. You had better remember when he does deliver you to take time to sing and praise. Don't just be so happy he took you out of it to just move on to the next thing now that it's over. You take that time to sing praises and give him glory and honor. I know you probably already do, but just please, you take that time. He says, verse 7, he said, Hear, O Yahweh, when I cry with my voice, and show me favor and answer me. He says, To my heart you have said, Seek my face. Your face, Yahweh, I seek. I hope he said that in your heart. Seek my face. And seek his face is what you should be doing. Do not hide your face from me. Do not turn your servant away in displeasure. You have been my help. Do not leave me nor forsake me, O Elohim of my deliverance. When my father and my mother have forsaken me, then Yahweh does take me in. Now I want you to focus a little bit on verse 10. This is, this is what we're talking about when it says, you still need to do what you can do. You need to do what you need to do. What he's saying here is when these things have been, are no longer there to help you, when your resources have run out, he says, look, my father and mother are not here to help me, then you help me. In other words, do all and stand, and then look to him to do all that you can't do. Do all and stand knowing he's helping you do what you're doing. So you might not need to stop. He may actually have you have success as you're doing. But with confidence, always say, this is the Elohim of my deliverance. He is your rock. He is your deliverer. He says, when my father and my mother have forsaken me, then Yahweh just take me in. When nobody else will help you and nothing else will work, Yahweh will help you. He will take you in. Teach me your way, O Yahweh, and lead me in a smooth path because of my enemies. Do not give me over to the desire of my adversaries, for the false witnesses have risen against me, and they breathe out, breathe out cruelty to me. What if I had not believed to see the goodness of Yahweh in the land of the living? Wait on Yahweh, be strong, and let him strengthen your heart. Wait, I say, on Yahweh. Now, do you see the connection? to Moshe at the Sea of Reeds saying, Stand still and see the deliverance of Yahweh. That's why I wanted to connect this psalm up with what we're doing in the Torah portion. But notice what he said again. He said, Do not give me over to the desires of my adversaries, for false witnesses have risen against me. Anybody have false witnesses rising against you? Accusing you of stuff? Pointing fingers at you? And they breathe out cruelty against you. But look at verse 13. He said, what if I had not believed to see the goodness of Yahweh in the land of the living? Yes, your treasures are being stored up in heaven. Yes, this life is really not about this life. It's about the next. But you should still have that optimism of hope that he gives you to say, yes, you should believe that you will see this in the land of the living. You should believe that it will happen in your days and that you will see deliverance, that you will see justice, that you'll see judgment, 
that your prayers will be answered now and in the age to come. But you have to be okay if it's just going to be the age to come. But he does say here, what if I had not believed? The entire scriptures, all that you read, this entire life from the time you were born to when you die, from the time Adam was created to the time the last person will pass at the very end, the last one that will ever die, before death and, uh, and sin are thrown in a lake of fire, all of this story, the saga, the accounts of the human race is about one thing, the battle between trust and belief and doubt and fear. That is what your life is all about, a continuous battle between fear and doubt and trust and belief. And that's what he's saying here. He says, wait on Yahweh. But see, when you're waiting, fear creeps in, doubt creeps in, panic creeps in. He says, wait on Yahweh and be strong. He doesn't just say wait. He says, be strong. And let him strengthen your heart because it's your heart that's melting. It's your heart that's panicking. He says, wait, I say, on Yahweh. And I say the same thing. Wait on Yahweh. Allow him the space to do the miracle. Let's see if we can squeeze one more in. Psalm 33. Tehillim 33. Shout for joy in Yahweh, you righteous. Praise is fitting for the straight. Praise Yahweh with the lyre. Sing to him with an instrument of ten strings. Sing to him a new song. Play sweetly with a shout of joy. For the word of Yahweh is straight and all his works are in truth. Loving righteousness and right ruling. The earth is filled with kindness of Yahweh. Sounds like what we read already, doesn't it? By the word of Yahweh, the heavens were made and all their hosts by the spirit of his mouth, gathering the waters of the sea together as a heap, laying up the deep in storehouses. Let all the earth fear Yahweh. Let all the inhabitants of the world stand in awe of him. See, we just said about fear and doubt versus trust and belief. Actually, there is a thing called a good fear, the fear of Yahweh. Because if you fear him and trust him and believe in him, you'll never be afraid of anything ever again. And that's why we did the teaching fear of Yahweh. So that's critical. It says the verse 8 again, Let all the earth fear Yahweh, the, all the inhabitants of the world stand in awe of him. For he spoke and it came to be. He commanded and it stood fast. Yahweh brings the counsel of the nations to nothing. He thwarts the plans of the peoples. The counsel of Yahweh stands forever. The plans of his heart to all generations. Now we're getting the word heart used in a slightly different way. The plans of his heart are going to happen to all generations as he has planned in his heart. Verse 12, Blessed is the nation whose Elohim is Yahweh, the people whom he has chosen as his own inheritance. And you ought to be thankful and praising him every day that you're among that people. Yahweh has looked from the heavens. He has seen all the sons of men. He looked from his dwelling place and in all the inhabitants of the earth. He who fashions the hearts of them all, he who understands all their works. Now let's stop there for a second. We first have a description of him fashioning and creating the known world, the universe, the waters and the seas and all that, the heavens and the earth. And now we're going to a point where he says he also is the one who fashions the hearts of all of us. He understands all of our works. Now, by fashioning the heart, it doesn't mean that he put in your heart everything that's in your heart. He's the master builder. He is the potter. You're the clay. He's molding your heart. He's putting you through circumstances and life situations that are going to affect your heart. They're going to bring you to an awareness of things that are in your heart that are going to give you an opportunity to choose to change your heart. So we always think about changing our mind, but it starts in our heart. So you need to change your heart. So he's fashioning your heart. Remember that when you read verses that say things like, he's going to create in you a new heart or a clean heart, or he's going to take out of you the stony heart and put in a heart of flesh. 
we like to think of this, and we're told this throughout our, our life, that this is kind of the magic of the Almighty. He's going to wave his mighty hand, and you're going to have a whole new heart, and this is, this is that, now we're dealing with magic. Now, he could do these things, but then you wouldn't be you anymore. And he doesn't want you not to be you. He wants you to be you, transformed into the image of his son, but you're still you. He wants you to be you with your, with your quirks and your personality and the joy that it is that we all know as we get to know and meet you and love you because you are unique. And you bring that unique personality to the, to the, to the, to the, to the universe to what he's trying to have happen. His plan for the whole whole future is that he's going to live with a bunch of people forever. He wants all of that wonderfulness of your, your, your unique personality to be involved in all that. That was so easy for me to say. just kept tripping out of my mouth. I'm just so excited about it that it just, it's just hard to even express. But yet I think that people just, it's almost like they're just not giving themselves enough value as an individual, to think that he's just going to change you into some sort of Yeshua clone, and we're all just going to be these kind of non-individual, all look the same, angel strumming harps, you know? But it's not that. He let you be individual because you are amazing as an individual, and you bring a uniqueness of, of perspective and life and joys and personalities and all these kind of things. You make us cry, you make us laugh, you make us smile, you make us upset. We do all of these wonderful things. And so he wants to then put you through circumstances that will inspire you to have the stony heart become flesh. He's going to crush your heart through circumstance and life so that you'll allow it to be crushed. And then you won't just harden your heart as we saw Pharaoh doing so many times. But you'll allow it to be softened and crushed so that it can be a heart of flesh. And this is what it's all about. He's not going to just wave his hand and just do it for you. He is going to, however, cause or allow you to be put in circumstances that will cause that to happen. And that's why it says that he's going to humble you one way or the other. That verse in Deuteronomy 8.2, we'll usually start with that he tested and proved to see whether it's in the heart. No, it starts out with he humbled them. He allowed them through that wilderness for 40 years to humble them. Remember it says, blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. A meek person is someone who's had their heart humbled and crushed. Continuing, if I can figure out where I left off. Verse 9, for he spoke and it came to be, he commanded and stood fast. We're in Psalm 33 still. Yahweh brings the counsel of the nations to nothing. He thwarts the plans of the peoples. The counsel of Yahweh stands forever, the plans of his heart to all generations. Blessed is the nation whose Elohim is Yahweh, the people whom he has chosen to be his inheritance. Yahweh has looked from the heavens. He has seen all the sons of men. He looked from his dwelling place on all the inhabitants of the earth. He who fashions the hearts of them all, he who understands all their works, the sovereign is not saved by the multitude of an army. A mighty man is not delivered by great strength. A horse is a vain means of safety. Neither does it rescue any by its great power. Now let's understand what that's talking about. He's not saying not to have a horse. He's not saying not to have an army. He's saying these are not the source of your deliverance. He's not saying so not, don't, don't have a fence around your property. Don't do anything to protect yourself. He's saying... Don't ever look to those as your deliverance. Because he did say to the Israelites to have them, to arm themselves. He did send them to battle many times. But he also said, when they went to, there were times, and you know this, you read the scriptures, when they went to battle without his authority first, what happened? They got thwarted, decimated, killed. I mean, it was not pretty. However, when he said, I am going with you, and when they did everything according to what he commanded to do, not a one of them died. Could you imagine going to war in a battle and nobody on your side gets killed? Yes, you can. That's right. Somebody said yes. You can imagine it only if it's Yahweh involved. If Yahweh's involved, a, you know, a hundred can send to flight a thousand or ten thousand. 
But if Yahweh's not, if you have the 10,000, the 10 or 100 is going to send you to flight. And that's what he's talking about here. He says that Yahweh is your deliverance. Verse 18, see the eye of Yahweh is on those fearing him, on those waiting for his kindness. Doesn't that match up with what we read in the previous psalm? Wait on him. His eye is on who? His eye is not on everybody, although he is watching everybody. He says, I've got my eye on you. Who? Those fearing him. That's why it's so important the fear of Yahweh teacher. He says the fear of Yahweh is what draws his attention. His eye is on you. He's not like he's just watching you to see if you're going to mess up. He's watching over you. That's what that metaphor is saying. He's watching over those who fear him. Of those who are waiting on his kindness. Verse 19, to deliver their being from death, to keep them alive during scarcity of food. Our being was as long for Yahweh, our help and our shield is he. For our heart does rejoice in him, for we have put our trust in his set-apart name. There's a connection there. You want your heart to rejoice? Put your trust in his set-apart name. Let your kindness, O Yahweh, be upon us, even as we wait for you. Amen. Amen. Avino Malkeno, our Father, King, Father, we come before you at the end of today's teaching, Father, just so wanting to rejoice in you, to seek your face, Father, to fear you properly. Father, teach us these things. Help us to seek to walk in integrity. Help us to have our heart straightened out. Father, help us to truly embrace you as our deliverer. Father, take us, examine us, and to in your love and your mercy with kindness and gentleness, show us where we're messing up. Show us where we're falling short. Show us what parts of us have not yet been transformed into the image of your Son. Father, please do that gently. We are fragile creatures, but show us nonetheless so that we can change and we can grow and we can become like your Son. Father, we love you so much. We delight in you. We are, we are taking for granted all too often the love that you've shed forth on us to show us a relationship with you, that you shed forth to open our eyes to see and our ears to hear, Father. Help us to never take that for granted. Help us to always have it before our eyes. Help us to always see your righteousness before our eyes. Help us to always be praising you. Father, we do love you so much. And after hearing this teaching and reading your words from Scripture, which is really all we did today, was read several of your psalms and the words you inspired the psalmist to write. Father, help us to truly seek your face and understand what you would have us to learn from these things. Allow your Ruach HaKodesh, your spirit in us, the teacher in us, to truly show us what we were supposed to get out of today's teaching. And Father, help us to submit to what we were supposed to get out of it, not just to intellectualize it, but to actually walk it, to incorporate it in our walk, to make it a part of who we are so that it's not just words, but it's actions, Father, and that those actions would be pleasing to you. Father, we ask these things, and we come humbly before you in the name of and in the authority of your Son, Yeshua HaMashiach. Amen. The Amen.